Hey viewers, my name's Kara. I warned you in a previous video that this video was coming. In this video, we are going to be talking about Buckland's Complete Book of Witchcraft, also known as Big Blue or The Big Blue Book. If you're looking at the screen while watching this video or if you saw the thumbnail, you know why. It's a big book and it's got a blue cover. In honor of that today, I am wearing a blue shirt. So we're talking about Big Blue today. This is not so much a book review video because this is not a new book by any means. This book has been around for a while. So I feel like calling this a review video is a little bit off because there are plenty of reviews out there already about this book. But what I want to do in this video is just talk about things that I came across while reading through this book cover to cover for the very first time in my life just this month, or last month? Last month, <laughs> and into this month. I had to look at my notes. Yeah, going from May into June of 2019. It was the first time I ever read this entire book cover to cover. And I wanna talk about some things that I noticed throughout it that I had never known before about the way that Raymond Buckland taught things or specific ways that his tradition taught things, etc. But before I get into that, I do just wanna do a little note, I guess, about the book. Even though this book has been around for a long time, in case any of you out there watching this are new to looking into neo-paganism or witchcraft and have never heard of this book yet or don't really know much about the book yet. So we'll talk about that for a second. This book was originally published in 1986. This is a copy of the second edition of the book. It was given a second edition about 15 years later. The copyright date in the cover says 2002, which is 16 years if you do the math. So I don't know if the copyright date just happened to be a little bit off, but they consider it the 15 year anniversary second edition. So this version of the book has an introduction to the second edition, as well as the introduction to the original book in the front. I of course recommend that you read all of it if you're reading the book cover to cover, that you read both of those. It puts it a little bit more into context with the time, talking about the way that things had changed over the first 15 years after the book was written. And so that's why the cover of this edition says down here at the bottom, the classic course in Wicca for 25 years. Does that make sense? Well, this printing of this actual book is part of the 18th printing of the second edition, and that is listed as 2015. So do that math. Is that 25 years? <laughs> 1986 to 2015? So yeah, this book has been around for a while. If you are not familiar with Raymond Buckland yet at all, he was known by many as the father of American witchcraft because after being initiated into Gerald Gardner's tradition in England, Raymond Buckland came back to the United States and was sort of tasked with bringing what he had learned to the United States. And so a lot of people referred to him as the father of American witchcraft. Gardner and Buckland were some of the first people openly publishing about these things and writing books like this that were meant for anyone to be able to use. So throughout this book, Buckland talks about the validity of solitary practice, the difference between being initiated into a coven and working on your own, and the pros and cons of each, but basically validating that those of us who learn on our own are valid and part of the community and that there are ways that the things that groups do can be altered to suit the solitary needs. Someone who is doing the entire ritual and all of its parts and all of the roles to play by themselves. And then it also, of course, talks about group practice, how that works, and yeah. So if you haven't heard of this book yet, it's a pretty big deal. <laughs> there are a lot of people who have been practicing the craft for decades 
who still list this as one of their most influential books. It's definitely a book that, I mean, it's, it's huge because it covers so many things in a very basic way. Like reading through this book gives you a very basic knowledge of a lot of things and I think makes it fairly clear. Some people would say this book is quite dated. It does include sections on such things as forging your own knife so that you can create your own athame and things like that. I think Uncle Buckland would be very proud of me because the water bowl that I have back here on my little impromptu altar, which by the way, I just set this up back here in the background in honor of talking about this book as well. This is not like a working altar that I actually use, but I put together some of the basic tools and things that I have, my versions of them. I think Uncle Buckland would be proud that this water bowl is one that I actually made myself in a ceramics course. <laughs> so stuff like that exists in this book. Um, just some of the things that I want to talk about though that I found interesting reading this book over a decade into my own path and already knowing a lot of little basic things of course. Interesting things that I came across. Um, first of all, I just think it's very helpful to go back and look at some of these older books that were part of shaping this movement, especially in my country here in the United States. I know it's different in other areas, and I am most in tune with how it has happened here. Those are the books that I tend to read about, um, Drawing Down the Moon by Margot Adler, things like that, focusing on how did the movement sort of erupt uh, in this country, The Spiral Dance by Starhawk as well. Um, so this is one of those very influential books. And I think that it's helpful anytime but like now, as we're seeing a resurgence of interest in the craft and people coming out as witches on social media um, very quickly and the types of sources that they're learning from are very different than this. The way that people have come to think of witchcraft is very different than this. And even the people that, even the way that people have come to think of Wicca is very different than it was at the time. So I think it's very helpful to go back and look at some of these books and see what were our craft elders essentially teaching at that time, at the get-go. How did it begin? And then see how has it evolved from there. Because this book, Buckland repeatedly emphasizes the fact that this is about witchcraft. It came to be known as Wicca, anything sort of related to Gardner and uh, Gardnerian or Alexandrian craft became known under the name of Wicca. Buckland talks about how that happened here. There's also a great interview with him from Witch Talk Radio that I've watched multiple times on YouTube. I will link it in the description of this video. I have recommended it to people before. You can actually hear in Buckland's voice him telling this story of how it kind of came to be that they never called it Wicca. That was a name that was given to it later on. To them, it was a form of witchcraft and it was a religion. And Buckland emphasizes that multiple times throughout this book, that witchcraft, as he teaches it, as they considered it at the time, the kind of practice that this book is talking about is witchcraft and it is religious. It is a religion. And these are things that people are arguing about a lot today. There are people who think that Wicca has nothing to do with witchcraft, even though a lot of the people who started or were very involved with what became known later as Wicca, all of their books talked about witchcraft, <laughs> you know, witchcraft today, witchcraft for tomorrow, witchcraft from the inside, complete book of witchcraft. These are books about what we now know as Wicca and it's witchcraft. It still is today, even though people use a different word for it. So I think things like that are very helpful to go back and see. Other interesting things specifically that, okay, I took seven pages of notes on this book, all right? Um, I'm not gonna go through all of them because again, a lot of it is basic information. I do recommend that you read the book if you haven't yet, even if you've been practicing for a long time, there's still some new and interesting things. Even if the like forging of my own knife is not something I would never ever do, I found that section incredibly interesting, you know? And like the story about how Buckland made his own horned god helmet from a metal mixing bowl and then attached horns onto it. And that helmet 
is actually in the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic that resides in Cleveland, Ohio, in the area where I am from. I've gotten to see it. It's like, it's incredible. So I love that aspect as well, that it, you know, in this day and age of people wanting bigger, fancier, shinier, prettier things and taking beautiful photos of them for social media, that like the father of American witchcraft made his horn god helmet out of a mixing bowl. Okay, so like, it's just really humbling and I think really cool. So stuff like that, um, talks about tools, talks about numerology, talks about energy, of course, talks about basic beliefs of this witchcraft, this form of witchcraft that they were practicing. Um, one of the first very interesting things that I came across in this book was talking about leadership and how it works in the Sayax Wicca tradition that Raymond Buckland actually founded. So in this book, he talks about priesthood or priestesshood is about leadership. It's not about power. It's not about having power over your students. And there are horror stories about groups that are like that. Those are not what it's meant to be. And Thorne Mooney's book, Traditional Wicca, A Seeker's Guide, also talks about that kind of thing and the reason for hierarchy and all sorts of things and how it works, how it's supposed to work. Uh, so Buckland talks about that a little bit in here, that the priesthood is about leadership. It's just about who's leading the group, who's leading the ritual. It might not be the same person every time. And so what I loved is that he talked about in the Sayax Wicca tradition, they actually choose their leaders by a democratic vote process, and they have terms that last one year. So every year, the coven members are actually voting on who they would like to act as their leaders for the coming year. That makes it so that different people have a chance to step forward and say, I think I'm ready to take on the role of leadership for this coming year. I would like to be considered. And then people can vote. So that way, if someone does a really excellent job and the coven wants them to lead again, they can vote them back in. And if they give someone a chance and they do a really horrible job and nobody wants them to be the leader again the next year, they don't have to vote for them. So I thought that was really cool and kind of reminds me of how the reclaiming tradition of witchcraft works in that there are a lot of groups w within reclaiming in my area in the States and probably also elsewhere, but I can really only speak for the ones that I've met, um, that work by community leadership, basically that Anyone who's part of the community can be a leader or a facilitator of a specific workshop. If you have an idea, you put together a ritual for everybody and everyone is invited to attend it, you are the leader for that ritual. If you come up with an idea for a workshop, you can facilitate it. So it kind of reminded me of that, but a little bit different because this is a formal group that's just voting on who they want their leaders to be. I thought that was really cool. That's not something that I ever knew about Buckland's tradition, the Sayax Wicca tradition. So, I thought that was cool. Um, this book does include scripts for many different rituals that you can actually just follow right along with as you're learning. Buckland was involved in the theater, which is another thing he and I had in common. I love that. So I, they really do feel like theatrical scripts and it talks about like the actions that you're doing and what multiple people are doing at the same time and who's saying what line. and giving different lines to multiple coven members so that more people are able to directly participate in what's going on. So that's really how they feel to me. It's like a little script. It's it's a piece of theater and, you know, ritual theater is very much a thing. Um, so acting out the stories of the Sabbaths and using that to transform our experience into something beyond standing in a circle reading out of a book. So love that. Um, there are definitely some things in this book that some of the things Buckland even says, like especially in the herbalism chapter where he's talking about medicinal herbs and magical herbs. And there's another chapter later on too where he directly says, look up other sources that are specifically about this topic because this is just an introduction. It's very basic. This is not meant to teach you really in depth about any of those more advanced topics like herbalism, but it's meant to introduce you to it. And there are a couple things in the book where he didn't say, 
check out other sources where I would say that. So specifically like when he mentions the chakra system, he mentions a little bit about it, but the diagram in here is not incredibly accurate to like what the Eastern tradition actually teaches or anything like that. And it's just very slight. And I wrote down in my notebook, like, I would recommend some other sources for people to actually like learn more about that system. And for some reason, he didn't say that in that section of the book. But later sections of the book, herbalism, things like that, he does say, please look up other sources and even recommends other sources. Another thing about this book that I didn't mention before, uh, for any of you who haven't seen it before, it's put together like a workbook. So when you read a chapter, at the end, there are lesson questions. It's basically like reading comprehension questions to see if you remember what you just read and help you to ingrain it. And then after that, there are examination questions, the little quiz questions that might be like, based on what you read in this chapter, if this problem came up in your coven or working group, how would you handle it? Or if, you know, what is the, this one right here says, what is the best time of day to meditate based on what you just read in that chapter? Um, so it really is geared more toward teaching and helping you really ingrain that material. So I think that's great. My phone is a little low on battery, so I just want to check. Is it going to let me check? Okay, I'm still good. All right, I got the little warning that it was low. I just wanted to check so I don't get cut off, um, as I am wont to do. So things like that, um, definitely, this is one of those books that, as I mentioned before, is just a basic look at a lot of different things. It's suitable, like, if you were to only read this book, you would know a little bit about a lot of stuff that you'd probably have to know. But you would not be fully versed in any of the more in-depth topics. And so there are definitely other books that you would want to seek out. There's recommended reading after every lesson, which is every chapter in this book, which I appreciate as well. I love a recommended reading section. What else here was very interesting to me? I mean, everything. <laughs> I'm just trying to see like what else did I specifically want to talk about in this book. There were some things getting into the later chapters where I was like, mm, that's interesting. I don't know if I would explain it the same way. And I think that that is good too, because for me, just at this point in my practice, being further down the line, it's a recognition that I'm at that point where just because I'm reading a book by Raymond Buckland doesn't mean that I then look at what it said and think, oh, then my definition must be wrong. It's more like knowing that this book was written in so many years ago, it was published in the late 80s, before I was even born. You know, this book existed before me, um, in this incarnation anyway. Knowing that certain things that were written at that time are not necessarily relevant to today. And so there are things that we might understand differently now. There are things that we might know more about now that just weren't known at the time. And there are just also things that are personal preference and like different ways that we would explain things. Like the way that Buckland describes dreams and the most probable cause for why we dream or like what dreams are or their purpose. I would explain it a different way. I don't think that either one is wrong. Is so things like that were just interesting to me to think like, oh, I've never really heard anyone explain it that way before. Interesting. Um, oh, tarot history is another area where I would recommend better sources on tarot history. Um, Robert M. Place's book, I forget the full title of it right now, but it's like tarot, history, magic, and something. I read it last year incredibly detailed into tarot history. I don't know if that book existed at the time that this book came out, but the tarot history that was given in a lot of books years ago was a little more, a little more mystified and imaginative and romanticized, which Robert Place actually talks about in this book that I'm referring to. I'll look it up and I'll put the link in the description for you as well. But I think I did do a review video of it at some point on my channel. Not sure, but I posted about it on Instagram, definitely. But, um, yeah, the, the kind of, like, imaginative, mystical history that uh, used to be given for tarot is talked about in the Robert Place book, but also the actual history and, like, how the cards actually came to be. So now that I've read that book, 
going back and reading this and reading that kind of romanticized history, I'm like, ooh, yeah, we have other information about this now that I would recommend to someone. So if I were to recommend this book, like, to a student, if I were to have formal students, there would be several other things that I would definitely supplement with, such as that book for tarot, a different book or website, resources for the chakra system, if that's something they even wanted to use. Some people don't want to bring in Eastern systems at all, and that's cool. Um, yeah, so different sources to supplement this, for sure. Always emphasizing in this book that ritual must have a purpose, and one of the most important things about doing magic or working with energy at all is feeling and that we have to really feel strongly about what we're doing. Emphasizing that participation is important. Again, purpose. I wrote it again in all caps because that's something else that is repeated. The importance of being recognized as a religion so that it, we have legally recognized religious protection under the law. Um, the fact that there were laws against witchcraft in England before Gardner came out and started writing about it, which is part of why nobody was talking about it. And then Gardner's book was published after the last witchcraft laws, anti-witchcraft laws, really, were repealed. So it talks a bit about that. It talks about our history. These are things that I think even if you don't personally identify with a path that is that falls under the smaller umbrella known as Wicca, uh, if you don't identify even as a witch specifically, but just another type of pagan or another type of practitioner of magic, I think that it's beneficial to know a bit about our history as a wider community. And again, just where we came from and therefore seeing how we got to where we are now. And looking at some of these arguments and debates that people are having today about does this word apply or does this word apply or does neither word apply and none of that makes any sense and always remembering that it comes down to personal preference so much of the time if we're initiating ourselves not ourselves if we are getting initiated into if we ourselves choose to become initiated into a formal group there we go if we're joining a group, they have specific ways of doing things that we will then become a part of. Otherwise, for our own selves, it's up to us to decide what's right for us. And just because we feel a certain way about a word or a term doesn't mean that the community as a whole feels that way or that the way society in general looks at us is the same way that we look at us, at ourselves. So yeah, I just think this is another one of those instances that we sometimes talk about of like going back to basics, getting back to our roots. Buckland's Complete Book of Witchcraft is definitely one of those things that a lot of people would consider part of their personal craft roots. As I said, I did not personally read this entire book until just this year. So I do not include it among the first books that I read, the really foundational books that helped me begin my practice because this just wasn't a book that I got my hands on at that point. But reading it now, I can absolutely see why it has that position in so many people's path history and why so many people do reference back to it now, even knowing that some things are a little outdated, some things we have more information about now, some things we have different information about now, whatever it may be, but it's still so beneficial to me to go back and see, all right, you know, put aside everything that's happening today, all the craziness that has come to be, go back to that beginning point of what were our craft elders, as we may call them, actually teaching closer to the beginning of when this movement was happening. And you know, and like for me, in this case, before I was born, this book came out originally before I was even conceived of, you know, in that regard. So whatever thoughts and opinions we may have, or I may have, looking back and seeing what was actually being taught at the time, 
let's start there and then go on. So thank you so much for watching this video. Let me know your thoughts about this book in the comments. If you have read it, if you consider it one of your foundational texts that you love and that you go back to. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, I know a lot of us, um, I was talking to some friends who also have not read it yet, and I was like, I kind of feel silly that I haven't read this yet, but I haven't. It just, it never came up. It wasn't a book that I got my hands on um, as a preteen when I was starting. And other people have said like, yeah, it's really sad that I've never read that book yet either. But it's like, it's understandable. We all find different books at different times. So yeah, let me know your experiences with this book if you have any. And if you don't have any, don't feel bad. But if you have time or the inclination to get a hold of a copy of it at any point in the future, I think it's worth a read, especially if you do identify as some sort of witch, um, just to see kind of that history and what this witchcraft, which was considered very much a religion, was all about and what they were talking about and how they were teaching it. Keep in touch with me on social media for other news and updates and fun stuff that may or may not be related to this book, especially if you're in the Cleveland area. And I'll see you next time. Until then, don't forget to be awesome, blessed be, and goodbye.